of 101 famous poems. The Present Crisis by James Russell Lowell. Spoken and with commentary by E. T. Hansen. When a deed is done for freedom, through the broad earth's aching breast runs a thrill of joy prophetic, trembling on from east to west, and the slave, where'er he cowers, feels the soul within him climb to the awful verge of manhood as the energy sublime of the century bursts full-blossomed on the thorny stem of time. Through the walls of hut and palace shoots the instantaneous throw when the travail of the ages rings earth systems to and fro. At the birth of each new era, with a recognizing start, nation wildly looks at nation, standing with mute lips apart, and glad truths yet mightier man-child leaps beneath the future's heart. So the evil's triumph sendeth, with a terror and a chill, under continent to continent the sense of coming ill, and the slave, where'er he cowers, feels his sympathies with God, in hot teardrops ebbing earthward, to be drunk up by the sod, till a corpse crawls round unburied, delving in the nobler clod. For mankind are one in spirit, and an instinct bears along round the earth's electric circle the swift flash of right or wrong, whether conscious or unconscious, yet humanity's vast frame, though its ocean-sundered fibers, feels the gush of joy or shame in the gain or loss of one race. All the rest have equal claim. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. Some great cause, God's new Messiah, offering each the bloom or blight, parts the goats upon the left hand and the sheep upon the right. And the choice goes by forever, twixt that darkness and that light. Hast thou chosen, O my people, on whose party thou shalt stand, ere the doom from its worn sandals shakes the dust against our land? Though the cause of evil prosper, yet tis truth alone is strong, and albeit you wander outcast now, I see around her throng troops of beautiful, tall angels to enshield her from all wrong. Backward look across the ages and the beacon moments see that, like peaks of some sunk continent, jut through oblivion's sea. Not an ear in court or market for the low foreboding cry of those crises, God's stern winnowers, from whose feet earth's chaff must fly, never shows the choice momentous, till the judgment hath passed by. Careless seems the great avenger, history's page but record one death grapple in the darkness, twixt old systems and the word, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet 
that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. We see dimly in the present what is small and what is great. Slow of faith how we can arm may turn the iron helm of fate. But the soul is still oracular amid the market's din. List the ominous stern whisper from the Delphic cave within. They enslave their children's children who make compromise with sin. Slavery, the earth-born cyclops, fellest of the giant brood, sons of brutish force and darkness, who have drenched the earth with blood, famished in his self-made desert, blinded by our purer day, gropes in yet unblasted regions for his miserable prey. Shall we guide his gory fingers where our helpless children play? Then to side with truth is noble when we share her wretched crust, ere her cause bring fame and profit, and tis prosperous to be just. Then it is the brave man chooses, while the coward stands aside, doubting in his abject spirit till his Lord is crucified, and the multitude make virtue of the faith they had denied. Count me o'er earth's chosen heroes, they were souls that stood alone, while the men they agonized for hurled the contumelious stone, stood serene, and down the future saw the golden beam incline to the side of perfect justice, mastered by their faith divine, by one man's plain truth, to manhood, and to God's supreme design. By the light of burning heretics, Christ's bleeding feet I track, toiling up new calories, ever with the cross that turns not back. And these mounts of anguish number how each generation learned one new word of that grand credo which in prophet hearts hath burned since the first man stood God conquered with his face to heaven upturned. For humanity sweeps onward, where today the martyr stands, on the morrow crouches Judas with the silver in his hands. Far in front the cross stands ready and the crackling faggots burn while the hooting mob of yesterday in silent awe return to glean up the scattered ashes into history's golden urn. Tis as easy to be heroes as to sit the idle slaves of a legendary virtue carved upon our fathers' graves. Worshippers of light ancestral make the present light a crime, was the Mayflower launched by cowards, steered by men behind their time? Turn those tracks toward past or future that make Plymouth Rock sublime? They were men of present valor, stalwart old iconoclasts, unconvinced by axe or gibbet that all virtue was the past's. But we make their truth our falsehood, thinking that hath made us free, hoarding it in moldy parchments, while our tender spirits flee the rude grasp of that great impulse which drove them across the sea. They have rights who dare maintain them. We are traitors to our sires, smothering in their holy ashes freedom's newlit altar fires. Shall we make their creed our jailer? Shall we, in our haste to slay from the tombs of the old prophets, steal the funeral lamps away to light up the martyr faggots round the prophets of today? 
New occasions teach new duties. Time makes ancient good uncouth. They must upward still and onward who would keep abreast of truth. Lo, before us gleam her campfires. We ourselves must pilgrims be, launch our Mayflower and steer boldly through the desperate winter sea, nor attempt the future's portal with the past's blood-rusted key. The easy way to be on the right side of history. It's easy to know the difference between right and wrong in hindsight. When the 13 American colonies rebelled against the English crown in 1776 to institute democracy, about two and a half million colonists had to decide whether to go with the new risky idea or stay loyal to feudal England. About 80,000 loyalists rejected democracy and fled to England or Canada, and of course, all of what is now Canada also rejected democracy. Today, Canada and England are proud to be democratic countries, but if you ask why it took them another hundred years to embrace the new idea, no one knows. When the southern states seceded from the Union almost a hundred years later in a bid to hold on to slavery, again Americans had to decide which side they were on. Though slavery was generally unpopular in the North, it wasn't so unpopular that anyone would have tried to end it if the South had not actively seceded. Most people were willing to accept slavery as long as it was limited to the South, and it is estimated that only 2% of Americans in the North actively supported abolitionism. Today, of course, we're all anti-racists, but I suspect that most of us, if we'd lived back then, would have been happy to turn in a runaway slave rather than hide him. I live as an American in Germany. Here we are confronted every day with the consequences of the bad decisions of an entire generation. In the democratic elections of 1932 and 1933, the Nazis were the most popular party. And during the Nazi period, even when the Second World War and the Holocaust were in full swing, the great bulk of Germans either actively or passively, supported Hitler, and hardly any at all actively resisted. Germans today can't understand how their grandparents could do something so stupid and despicable, but I suspect if they had lived under Hitler, they too would have found some very convincing arguments to support him. Today, the big moral and political decisions we face are insignificant by comparison sometimes embarrassingly so. While our forefathers fought off lions, tigers, and bears, we discuss whether a cat or a dog is the best support animal. Yet we also choose sides, and I often wonder if I am on the right side. I'm no fan of trends. I mistrust popular fashions deeply, mainly because popularity breeds conformity. If something is widely popular, it's safe to assume that a large percentage of the people following the trend have not researched the issue and thought it through. It's our nature to run with the crowd. But that doesn't mean those of us who reject popular trends are automatically right. I don't participate in woke culture. I suspect it will do more harm than good, especially to those who believe in it as one believes in a religion. But at the same time, I have to admit that a little more diversity might be a good thing. Critical race theory and the dogma of white privilege, like any movement that defines good and evil according to skin color, is once again pitting one ethnic group against the other. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't ask ourselves, from time to time, whether our American democracy couldn't be a little more fair. Climate change has inspired activists to predict the imminent end of the world again and again. And of course, none of these predictions ever materialize. But a change is undeniably coming, and I'm not sure it's a good idea to ignore it. It's true that feminism today has deteriorated to a large extent into a combination of man-hating and the glorification of victimhood. 
But the relationship between the sexes is undeniably changing, and it makes sense to ask ourselves, what part do I play in this change? I believe that Americans in general, indeed the Western world in general, have a pretty good moral compass. We make mistakes, but when we do something right, it often turns out to be very, very right. Today, we face a plethora of decisions and issues that could go either way. They may turn out to be important or insignificant, right or wrong, a blessing or a curse. We won't know which for another 50 or 100 years. Yet, we have to decide now which side we're on. There is one easy way to be on the right side of history. Sheer blind luck. For the rest of us, we have to think long and hard about the issues and about our responsibility to the future and make a decision without any guarantees. I wish all of us the strength to overcome the petty politics, the artificial outrage, and the posturing on both sides so we can make those decisions with a clear head, an independent heart, and free of manipulation. And most of all, I hope when the day comes and we look back and see clearly which side of history we were on, we will be proud of our choices. About James Russell Lowell. James Russell Lowell, 1819 to 1891, was an influential American Romantic poet. Born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Lowell earned a law degree at Harvard, where he had a reputation as a troublemaker. He was married twice and, over the course of his life, worked as a professor of languages at Harvard, the editor of The Atlantic Monthly, and ambassador to Spain and to the court of St. James. Lowell was a political poet and achieved fame with a collection of satirical anti-war poems written in dialect, the Biglow Papers. His most enduring poem is The Present Crisis, which he wrote as a protest to slavery, and it quickly became the anthem of abolitionism. The poem still resonates today. The NAACP named their newspaper The Crisis after it. The hymn, Once to Every Man and Nation, was based on the poem, and it was quoted in the second impeachment of President Donald Trump. ¶¶ 